Welcome to 4U Radio, where the gospel's for the believer and the unbeliever alike. I'm Craig D'Onofrio, pastor of Redeemer Lutheran Church in Wilmer, Minnesota, don't you know? Uh, I got another Minnesota pastor with me, so I'm excited today. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, anyway, I'm happy to be at 1517's Here We Still Stand conference in San Diego. Yet another podcast from this wonderful gathering go to 1517.org go check out all of the speeches that have been given at this great event and uh, one of them will be pastor donovan riley that you can hear this is and correct. you will hear all sorts of wonderful gospely jesusy wonderful things yes but first we need to wrestle or actually uh get a little roll going on our jujitsu here uh, right I, I did take jujitsu for all of six months did, right, and separated my shoulder and mm. called it quits. So Th- yeah, those are the consequences of <laughs> entering into the dojo, yes, yeah. <laughs> the kumite. So not only is Donovan a pastor extraordinaire, but he is also a lethal master, of MMA the arts. coach and tra- oh, MMA coach. Yeah, I do muay thai, even. kickboxing, wrestling, jujitsu. Yeah, the whole the whole don't thing. Don't kick me in the shin. Yes, that's not good. Uh, anyway, <laughs> pastor at St. John's Lutheran <laughs> Church in Webster, Minnesota. Now, you are south of the Twin Cities, I'm right? I'm 40 miles south of Minneapolis. So, so. I have to drive 100 miles east, east and then yes. hang a right yes. for 40 miles. Correct. Okay, yep. yeah. I'll show up on your doorstep. I, again, days. I grew up right down the road from where you serve in I didn't know Atwater you grew Grove up City in Litchfield. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you grew I up in elementary Minnesota. school in Atwater and uh, later elementary and junior high in Grove City. Yeah. I thought you were Mexican. Yeah, I know. I, well, I wish. But <laughs> <laughs> you spend time in Mexico. Yes. That's that's the inside joke there. So, Donovan, mm-hmm. it's good to have you on the program. You're yeah, one of us. You. Adult. Converted, adult children. Converted oh. <laughs> Lutherans. To, yes, I am. To Lutheranism as an adult. Which yes. Which means, in my book, you are trustworthy and uh, you can be... Assumed a that man you, without guile. Yes, yeah, you know what the gospel is. So, but mm-hmm. the the topic of the conferences mm-hmm. here is the church. Yeah, and you're speaking on the bride of Christ. Right. So, what sort of goodies will we hear from you? So, well, actually, I already did my thing. But if you're listening oh. to this in the future, it's still coming. I but thought you were in the no I tomorrow's. Just, I was really today. I was three forty-five today. I was probably so. sleeping in. No oh, worries. Three forty-five. I was doing this. That's what I was doing. You were right. Right. There's in my there. name right to your left. Did they clap? Yes. Oh, good. When good. I ended, <laughs> thank God it's over. <laughs> it was turning into a hostage situation. <laughs> no, it it. What I addressed is because in the Lutheran Church in particular, we have kind of over the last several decades, in particular, especially for those of us in the kind of Lutheran Reformation tradition. We tend to talk of the church as both virgin and, and whore or prostitute, and we use examples of like Gomer from the book of Hosea right, or yeah. Rab or, or even Tamar. And then we look to Mary and, and others to hold together the, we would call it the similar, the kind of the two sides of the church, that she's both virginal but also this kind of imprudent uh, Rahab figure. And so what I did is to approach it from a, a different kind of vector to say, okay, we tend to then get caught in this category of, well, the Old Testament's where we go to look for the prostitute imagery, the New Testament's where we go to look for the virgin imagery, and then we marry those two together and we use those as examples of the church and how to describe our relationship to Jesus as the bridegroom and how that happens, where that takes place on the, on the cross. And so in my uh, presentation today, I actually took up the case of Jephthah's daughter and the prostitute who washes Jesus' feet. And say, no, there's examples of the church as virgin all over the Old Testament. But we have to go really deep into the cross. We have to go really deep into, the, into Christ crucified to, to have that kind of shown to us. Because, as Dr. Luther said, every page of Scripture preaches Christ. Which means then, in the book of Judges, chapter 11, when you come to Jephthah and his daughter, who's never named, it's a very brutal, very stark, almost like a Cormac McCarthy tale within the Bible, but that's what Judges is too, kind of like a Cormac McCarthy novel. Right, right. It's very brutal and we, raw. We did a whole series on yes. Judges on this, this podcast. Yes. And it, it was It, it, it disturbs my memories that <laughs> I read trippy. Judges for comfort. It's, it's my favorite book of, well, the, of the Old Testament. I mean, the, the deal is, it's, it's this downward spiral yes. of stupid. Correct. And, and the more stupid people get, the more faithful yes. God is. So, and everyone stops at Samson and says, he's the worst. And I say, no, keep going. Hold it my gets beer. Right? so much worse. 
let me tell you about this civil war that started. Right. Yeah. And so looking at Jephthah's daughter, which to the Jewish commentators and Christian commentators to the present tense, has always been explained away as Jephthah making this stupid vow that if God gives him right. victory over the Ammonites, he'll sacrifice the first person who comes out of his house to greet him. Turns out it's his daughter. What kind of an idiot vow is right. that? I mean, it's just And nuts. as a consequence, we dismiss it in that sense. We explain away Jephthah as being this kind of ignoble, brutish warrior in the present tense, misogynistic. And she's this pure virginal character that that didn't deserve that. And it's even taken to the extent of that's, that's Jephthah's uh, Jephthah's punishment for that vow versus in the context of the story it's actually in the one sense he is the Christ figure because he sacrifices his own blood to save the nation to save his people but even deeper than that his daughter is the Christ figure because she's both the sacrifice and the sacrificer because she says no what you have vowed to God must happen it must take place and it's her blood then as the child of the father her blood is poured out as a sacrifice to save the nation. And unlike Isaac's sacrifice, when the ram was given as a replacement, there is no replacement for Jephthah's daughter. She is the lamb. She is the blood. And so, again, this points us forward to not only Jesus' sacrifice to say Jephthah's daughter points us to that, but even further than that, it points us to the present tense, this is the church, that we are the consequence, the, the victory that we've been given on a cosmic scale, scale by Jesus' sacrifice and the pouring out of his blood is our victory. It's the victory of the people. And, and then lastly, the church is founded, it's established, it's created from the blood and water that flows from Jesus' side. This is what makes him our bridegroom and why we call the church the bride and refer to her as you know she and her historically. And then baptism and the sacrament of the altar, the Lord's Supper, then become the thing that actually opens the gates of paradise to us because the blade that pierced Christ's side is the blade that was wa uh, waved by the angel guarding the gates of paradise. And so when we're baptized and when we receive his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins, paradise is opened up to us as bride. And then paradise becomes the bridal chamber in the resurrection. And so we we cling to this this dual image of virgin and prostitute because... That means that anybody who comes in the church, whether they're virginal, whether they have a past or a present that they're ashamed of, mm. whether they look down upon or whether they think they're deserving, whether they think they're holy or unholy, it makes no difference because then in the New Testament, when the prostitute enters into the Simon the Pharisee's house and washes Jesus' head and feet with her tears, he, you know, that she is an instrument of God's grace and love. And he takes her tears and he baptizes her with that. And he purifies her. He sanctifies her in that moment. And again, it opens the way for our baptism to say, there is no one who is beyond my love. There's no one who's beyond redeeming. And that's the church. So rather than maybe joke about the church being a kind of whore, we can cover her shame in the sense of, no, that's what Jesus' blood does. This is what the water does, is it actually covers us. Mm. And that's what makes the church. So rather than looking up for what's good and beautiful and true in God, we're pointed down to what we would consider in a worldly sense very ugly and, and imprudent and, and too uh, fleshy and earthy. And Jesus says, well, that's me. Like, I did that for you. And that's really then the gospel is the for you of the gospel is in that. Whoever you were, in, in the eyes of God, you're all prostitutes because you've all jumped out the bridal window and run off into the woods and he's run after you and saved you and brought you back. And he's saying no one's beyond redemption and there is no divorce in this marriage. So no matter what you do, I will always come and find you hmm. and bring you back. It's kind of like uh, Hawkeye in The Last of the Mohicans in the movie. <laughs> no matter where you are, I will find you. <laughs> I, I love that you're saying whoever you were. Yes. And, and I think that... You know, God loves to give nicknames. Yes. And and I think that that's a big part of it. You know, mm -hmm. why does why does Saul become Paul? And I think so that Paul could leave Saul behind. Correct. You know, he, right. he can leave the shame right. and everything else. You know, what he did to Stephen and yes. all that, he can leave all that behind. Right. And it's such a, a beautiful thing. And it's a picture of baptism that God gives us a name in baptism. Correct. He gives us his name. Yes, exactly. So in, in essence, so we can leave ourselves Correct. behind, right? It's, for example, if... When I minister to women that have had abortions, mm. you can't unrepent of that. Yeah. It's happened. 
and yet in Christ he says, you are reborn, you are a new creation, yeah. and I will. I died for that too, and I redeemed that too, and even your unborn child, I made your unborn child because he or she was made by the word. And as Colossians 1 says, everything was made by him, through him, for him. So even your baptism into Christ also means that you can actually pray and ask him that in the resurrection, your aborted child can be there to greet you as well. And likewise in addiction, when you come in and you're an addict, whether you're clean or not, whether you've relapsed or not, that's not your identity. Your identity is child of God. Your identity is bride of Christ. And whoever you were, as far as he's concerned, you're sober, you're clean, you're virginal again. Right. And for anybody who has a past or even a present, and they come in and say, but I did it again. You know, yeah. oops, I did it again. As our friend Stephen Paulson says, the old Adam has a 100% rate of recidivism when it comes to sin. And yet, what really upsets us then is that every time we come back and go, how about this time? He goes, yeah, that too. Yeah. yeah. I, I love the question, how many times did the prodigal right. son return to the pigsty? Yes, you know? exactly. And because we, we, we see the story in the Bible. It's like, okay, now he's back with that, and life is beautiful, right. and everything is <laughs> yes. glorious. And No. No. No, he... he he went back and he, he looked at right. those pigs. He's like, you know what? There are good times back there right. with those pigs. Right. <laughs> right. I think what happens is then we end up getting confused about what holiness is. Hmm. Because we, we use terms like the holy, the rite of holy baptism, the holy sacrament, the holy church. You know, we're saints. And again, we're presented this idea, this image of a saint as someone who kind of levitates off the ground. Kind right. of like this magical figure versus, right. no, a saint is literally a sinner who's just clothed in... Christ, clothed in the blood of Christ. Like Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Yes. And so the life I now live, now live, I live by faith in the one who sacrificed himself for me. And even as Dr. Luther points out in his commentary on uh, lectures on 1 Corinthians, when Paul says that Christ was made to be sin, it's not an adjective. It's He's saying it in the indicative. It's a fact. God made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become. So if you say, I am a sinner, or what about my sin? If you don't then say what I mean by that is my Christ, because my sin is Jesus, as Luther says, he becomes sin to sin, death to death, devil to the devil. So even our resistance to being saved and forgiven and given grace and mercy, he goes, no, I refuse to allow you to climb up on my cross. I became sin for you so that you might walk in this life and say, but I sin. You can't say that apart from me. And so... If you enter in and say, well, I don't think I should come to the Lord's Supper because I don't deserve it, I'm not worthy. It has nothing to do with deserving or worthiness. It has to do with the fact that he says, I did this for you, now take and eat. This is the wedding feast. And in the wedding feast, he says, I know who you used to be. And it's like um, the prophet says, you know, I found you in a field and you were naked and you were abandoned. And I washed you and I healed you and I dressed you in jewels and the finest linen and gowns. And then we take it off and we sell it and we run back and he just comes back. And again, that offends us so deeply because we think that God is good and beautiful and true and above us and beyond us versus, but he became man. But I want to ask you this. Yes. Does he say, I know who you used to be, or has he put it so far away that he remembers no no longer who you are? Well, that's, you know, yes. Does, does he still say, I remember you were Saul? No. But We but, say it. Yeah, right. Yes. Yes. Right. So, and, and that's the thing, you know, Luther makes that, that statement that, yeah. you know, when the devil accuses you, yes, you just kind of look him in the eye and go, yeah, you're right. What of it? Yeah, you, what of yeah, it? I exactly. deserve to go to hell, but yes. I've got a savior. His name exactly. is Jesus Christ. Right. Go pound sand. In, <laughs> in the freedom of the Christian, he goes so far as to say, and this is so radical. He says, even the devil is made by God to participate in a Christian salvation uh-huh. because he's still the God's devil. Yeah. And yeah, he can yeah. do nothing to you like in Job. He can right. do nothing to you unless he's allowed. And so when the devil threatens you and and tempts you and, and says, you deserve this, you say, thank you for reminding me that I'm a baptized child of God. Yeah. Because if I if I went past the church this Sunday on my way to Perkins, he wouldn't bother with me. Right. He'd say, I'll see you back home. Versus we approach Jesus and say, I am. Right. It's like Psalm 51. You know, you're just, and I deserve this. And he says, I don't, I don't know about that. Yeah. And so we're the ones who bring up our past. And we're the ones who argue right. for judgment. And he says, but the judgment's already been rendered. I took it. Yeah, and and yet we're so busy trying to shame ourselves. Like, yes, like we're we're trying to, and it's a form of idolatry. Hundred percent. Yeah, percent. But but we're shaming ourselves, and every now and then I know you know yes. my dark past will visit me, and yes. I'll say, hey, uh, you, yes. you you have me confused for someone else. Correct. You know that was Saul. I'm Paul. Yes. I'm someone different now. Right. Well, and that's why we look at 
people on the other side of the pew or on the other side of the table and say, ew, and we condemn them as a kind of distraction, diversion from ourselves so that we can say, well, at least I'm not that, versus, but why don't you see Christ in your brother or sister? Why don't you see Christ in them? That's why we have communion. That's why we have our baptismal promise repeated to us by our pastor and by other Christians. And it's like Luther says in Schmall called Articles, that's the mutual consolation and consolation of the brethren. That's what the gospel is. And so when we start pointing fingers and we start saying, well, she or he, this, that, the past especially, we, we simply have to acknowledge that's the devil whispering in our ear, tempting us. That's, mm, his, right. that's the wicked angel saying, really? And yet every time you return to the table, every time you return to the font, every time he sends you a preacher, somehow your past just doesn't seem all that important. Right. But your future is already uh, a certainty. Right. You're a child of paradise. And so hopefully then, that's the point, is that the hope of eternal salvation is just that, that the gates of paradise are open. And, you know, the criminals that were crucified on either side of Christ when he was on the cross, the one curses and abuses him, and the other says, no, this is justice, we deserve this. Right. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now he still has to die. They both still die, because that's unfortunately the gate into paradise, is through death into eternal life. That's the consequence of sin, the wages. Right. And yet, we live in hope that death... I was reading this morning, and the, an ancient father said, this world is our tomb. Because it's the world of... It's temporary. It's the world of death. It's the world of, the, you know, the flesh and so on. It's the prince of the power of the air is the authority over this world. So therefore, we live in hope in the church that the ark is the, you know, of the church. And we live in the hope that, no, at the last day, this will all be renewed, all be regenerated. Everything will be like Isaiah describes. It'll be Genesis again, Genesis 1 all over again. That's our hope then. So we don't lose hope because the world goes one way or the other, or somebody wins the election, somebody doesn't, or culture shifts one way or the other, because we know this is all passing away. Right. And yet we know Christ died in a cosmic battle against the powers of darkness, and he won. So we can look at the elections, we can look at culture, we can look at you know, our family, our friends, ourselves, and say, but Jesus died for this too. Right. So no one is beyond hope. Right. And the church is a place then where you come and you enter into that to be, to be told, no, not only is there hope for you, but here, take and eat, take and drink, receive the, this word given, you know, you are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. And as far as your past goes, again, he, he left that in his tomb when he rose from the dead. And so if you want to find it, you're going to have to take a trip to Jerusalem and try and hunt down the right cave. <laughs> and I think that's the beauty, too, of not right. knowing which tomb was his and where he actually, because we would turn that into a holy thing that we could, you know, venerate. Well, I'm sure there are several tour guides that there would charge you good several, money. Guys. Yes, <laughs> yes, like, like Luther's ink spot. Right. Rather than, no, the, the beauty of his resurrection is he's not here. He's gone ahead of you. Right, yeah. He's waiting. Yeah. And what, what happens when his disciples meet? He feeds them. Hmm. And he gives them absolution. So what are you going to expect when you come into the church? He's going to feed you and give you absolution. What are you going to get at the last day? Come and sit at my table. You're my guest of honor. Eat, drink, be absolved. It's, it's sad that so few churches proclaim this. Right. That there's so much of this go out there and do better yes. and try harder. Yes. And, and, and not just that, but what you're talking about here is also a, a full-throated law that uh, yeah. you are dead yes. in your sins and trespasses. Yeah. There's yeah. there's no hope for Nada. you. Nada. You're yes. not going to get resuscitated no. here. No. Uh, but in, in your death, you will also have a resurrection. Correct. And well, so there's that. Robert Capon, in, in the book, uh, The Mystery of Christ and Why We Don't Get Him, his first opening salvo is, we think that Jesus is this lifeguard, and we're drowning, and he swims out, and he saves us. And he says, no, 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 no. And he tells this beautiful parabolic story. And the lifeguard writes something, hangs it on his clipboard, swims out, drowns, and then the person he swam out drowns. And then they <laughs> read the clipboard and it says, in my death, she is saved. Right. And we always think Jesus is going to throw us a life vest or, or something to cling to. But that's, in late medieval theology, that's the third plank of, of penance. That's penance. That's the whole sacrament of penance is hmm. cling to the plank, the wreckage of, of this ship. Whereas we point out there is no wreckage. The ship is the church. Yeah. That's why we call it the nave. And that's why right. the, you know, the term navy comes from the word nave, the root. It's, that's what this is. It's not an ark that can, can be broken apart. It won't disintegrate around you. It will hold you safe throughout the flood, throughout the storms, throughout judgment, we're safe. And so flee to the church. And understand I'm saying the big C church so that 
as you described, I teach my confirmands and my children this. I teach them how to judge a sermon. This is a great sermon, Jesus Christ for you for the forgiveness of sins. This is a good sermon. It's about Jesus. It's about what he did. It's about what the gospels say. A bad sermon is about you and what you're doing and what you're saying. Same thing with a hymn. Same thing when you walk into a church. Here's how you judge a church. Where's the font? Do you see the font? Is it open? Is there water in it? Is it up front? Is it somewhere? Or can't you see it? All right, if you can't find it, look on the altar. Is the bread and wine on the altar? Are the elements there? And if they're not, you might be in trouble. Hmm. And then lastly, I want you to look at up on the board or look on the screen and say, what are we singing? Because I think nowadays it's what we sing is what we believe rather than what we pray. And if you read those, if you go through those songs or those hymns and they're not Christ, they're not even Christ focused, you need to get out of there because there's little hope the gospel is going to be preached right. because all the gospel elements, all the tools, the concrete, tangible gospel is not there. And you abstract gospel may satisfy you if you're in a good mood that Sunday, you're feeling optimistic, but in a crisis when, again, the devil comes up alongside and goes, hey, remember back in your 20s? Or you remember the other day? Or, yeah, there's no hope for you, man. Why are you here? The future mm-hmm. is black. It's, it's closed for you. You need that. You need to be reminded you're a baptized child of God and you're free in Christ to go serve the Lord. You need to have the body and blood there available. And even if you don't have it every Sunday, call your pastor and say, I'm really struggling. Can I come and receive or can you bring it to me? I need it. Because I always talk about when I preach a sermon and you hear that and you've had a week or a life and you go, if pastor really knew my life, he would never say these things to me. So that must be for the person behind me or beside me. But when you come up to the Lord's table and I put the, the bread and the wine in your mouth, there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever this is for you for the forgiveness of sins. You have Christ. Right. That's actually one of the struggles with the corporate absolution that we do. Yes. And one of the, you know, I, I talked about this with Del Campbell in the yeah. last episode, yeah. but uh, one of the most beautiful things about our faith as Lutheran Christians is we walk into church mm-hmm. And the first thing we do is say, I suck and deserve to go to hell. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and that's, I mean, we sing a song first. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. We say, we say I yes. suck and deserve to go yes. to hell. But then, then we hear those words of absolution. Right. That you are forgiven for the sake of Christ. Right. He has redeemed you and forgiven you. Because if we didn't know that that was coming, we would turn our confession into a rededication of ourselves to God. Yeah. Because the weight of saying, I've sinned, and the response is silence or we'll do better, is crushing. It's absolutely crushing to the person who's struggling. And again, as pastors, we're not clairvoyant. We don't have telepathy. We don't know what's happened to you this week. Oh, I know. I know. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Just open the blinds and you'll see me. (laughs) And so we can't presume to know what every individual member is going through. And we don't need to because we're not given to do that. As Dr. Luther said to his students, we don't chase confessions. Right. Instead, what we do is we simply absolve. That's we are forgiveness. We are vendors of forgiveness. And that's what you could expect. And as I tell my people, once I absolve you, I will never bring that up again. If you want to bring it up, you're free to do so, but I'll just absolve you again. But pastor, what if I keep doing it? Oh no, you will for sure. That's an (laughs) app. That's a certainty. But he keeps forgiving you and the power of the gospel, because it is a living word of God and is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the very soul of the individual is you will serve your neighbor you will bear your cross, but it, again, it's an easy, light yoke and burden. So I don't need to say, hey, you know what you need to do now? Rather, I trust that the Holy Spirit will produce fruit through you because of the power of the gospel at work in you. And, you know, since the Enlightenment, we, turn, we, we tend to think in terms of agency. What am I supposed to do? Call the play God and I'll run, the, I'll run it. Versus Dr. Luther and pre-moderns, they talked in language of instrument. I'm an instrument. I'm a vessel. The New Testament uses that term all the time and in the old testament i'm a vessel of god Mm. i'm an instrument he works through me my wife is an instrument of god for my sanctification actually because she's my cross but also as dr luther says god is at work through her to humble me to to bring me closer to him to to love me and god is love jesus is god jesus is love so the love that i have for my wife isn't pointing me to god as a represent god it actually is god at work, and that's grace. Because even the unbeliever, again, he makes the rain and the sun to shine and fall and the good and the evil alike. It's just that as Christians, we go, this is the fruit of the gospel. This is the fruit of Christ, is I can say in faith, my bride is God working for my for my good. 
but then it points back to the church who is the bride of Christ. So then I can look at the members of the church and look at other baptized Christians and say, we are the bride, you are the bride, and so God is working through you for my good right. too. And that takes the burden off of us to perform. It's not transactional. Right. It's not tit for tat. It's not reward and punishment. The punishment is there saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the punishment. He takes it all. All means all. It can't mean most, just like a marriage. You can't be 50% in a marriage. You have to be all in. Or I'll ask, what are you holding back? What are you holding out for? Jesus hold, holds out for nothing. He takes it all. And so if you want to talk about your sin, your abortion, your addiction, your lies, cheating on your taxes, you're ashamed of who you voted for, it's right there on the cross. It's mm -hmm. all there on the cross. And he refuses to allow you to climb up and take his place. There's only one Jesus. Yeah. Oh, gosh, that's all so good. Uh, we just have a couple minutes left. Yeah. But w one of the things that uh, you, you kind of touched on is our view of the church mm -hmm. is sometimes a place where we go to get better or something sure. like that. Yes. And uh, more of the church is more of a hospice where we go Correct. to learn to die, die. basically, right? I, I'm even... I understand the, the, the church as a hospital for sinners, and you receive the medicine of immortality you know, right. used to yeah. describe the sacrament. Yeah, However, that. it's like I have, I have kind of a problem with the term brokenness and the term broken being used because we're not a broken teapot that he glues back together. We're dead, and we need to be raised from the dead. Right. And so, yes, it's a hospice where you come to die and be resurrected. It's in our, our catechism and our baptismal explanations that I am daily drowned and put to death and therefore daily raised to live a new life and walk in Christ. So every day you're dying and being raised from the dead. As Kenneth Corby, one of our beloved professors said, yes, sir. when you go to the Lord's Supper, it's like going to your resurrection because when you go, you go to your resurrection, you're going to the Lord's Supper. So you're practicing dying every night when you go to sleep and you're practicing being raised from the dead every morning when you wake up. And so when you die physically and you flatline, you're simply, again, Jesus never saw a dead person that he said was dead. He said they're asleep. But he saw lots yeah. of living people he called dead. Yeah. He goes, you're dead. Because I'm the word of God and I created you. And if I say you're dead, you're dead. And if I say you're alive, even if you're dead, I am the resurrection and the life. Even though a man dies, he will not die. That's the message of the church. That in the midst of nothing, nihilistic nothing, the church's message is, oh, but wait, that's not the last word. The last word is, I'm the resurrection, not the life and the resurrection, uh, resurrection and life. Right. So what we're handing out at the church, what we're giving away for free, which nobody would beg, borrow, steal, or barter us for, is new life through death and resurrection. Right. Well, Pastor Donovan Riley, thanks so much for yeah, being with you. me on 4U Radio. You know, one of my favorite hymns has a line in it that says, Teach me, O Lord, that I may dread the grave as little as my bed. Yes. And uh, that's one of 18 hymns that will be sung at my funeral. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That's right. How dare you talk about me at the funeral? Sing. <laughs> but uh, that's that's our goal. And yes. that's that's the dream is that I can face death as yes. as with as much comfortable comfort as yes, I exactly. as Amen. I slide into my sheets at night. Yes. And Donovan, Perfect. thank you so much thank for you, the Craig. words of grace you. and God's peace be with you. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you in his grace. We'll see you. For You Radio is a 1517.org Good. production. To listen to this radio broadcast and podcasts and broadcasts like this one, I invite you to visit 1517.org. There you will also find many publications and free resources, including classes on Christian apologetics, church history, philosophy, and so much more. We are completely funded by generous donors like you. Would you consider making a generous gift to our work of spreading the gospel? Simply visit 1517.org.